Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that great introduction and everybody and welcome to the panel. Uh, you have a little bit of a homework because we're gonna start with a poll that's gonna go up on screen in just a second. We want you to ask and answer these questions. You can read that yourselves and uh, please do fill that in. And I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes just to introduce uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. So heated debate on the European health data space. But what this panel is gonna look at is what happens in the next five years. So what should you know, the next EU institutions in the member states, in the European Commission, in the Parliament, in Council, what should they be thinking of? And today we have launched a paper. Please go up and have a look. Uh, we've put recommendations that the executives of our members, some of them here on, on our panel, have come together and, and made uh, some clear recommendations. And very quickly, what are they? It's to make sure that we prioritize digital in all healthcare policies. So we want to remove fragmentation that an implementation of the EHDS may cause. We want to make sure we're safeguarding rights as well. Accelerate the use of data because that will really open up things like precision medicine and digital twins, uh, real world evidence and population management. We want to improve skills. We've heard a lot about that today, but we also need the people that are doing public procurement and doing uh, the authorities that are approving devices that go to market, they need to understand what these technologies mean as well. We need funding that's dedicated to digital health, and we need legal clarity and consistency, right? So we need IP protection that is clear, that builds confidence so companies want to invest. So go up and have a look at our paper. I hope you enjoy it, and we're always open for feedback. Um, but we're now going to, and I've just put up the results of the, of the poll. I'm now gonna ask Francesco uh, if you don't mind going first. It, we're, I'm not going to do it exactly as you see here. I'd like Francesco to go first. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to ask you, um, can you share some insights on how data science technologies, such as AI, machine learning, how are they being utilized in patient care and outcome? And, and also, how do you see these technologies overcoming some existing barriers in European healthcare? How much time do I have? You have three minutes. <laughs> because we could speak about hours. <laughs> <laughs> So, but f first of all, I, I think last April um, there was a very iconic cover of The Economist with AI, with an angel and a devil. And I think in the media debate, we've seen a lot speak about the devil side. Um, let's be perhaps put a bit on the angel side of, of that part. And, and I mean, it's not the first year I'm here, and I'm even more confident on making the following statement this year is that most probably with the convergence of technology and a lot of import of data science and then artificial intelligence and science, I think we'll be able to have a progress in healthcare in the next 10 years bigger than we have had in the past 100 years. And, and that's, I, I think, should already, even if it's after lunch, uh, excite a bit us, all, all of us, because we can solve a lot of problems in all the value chain. I mean, think about diagnostic. What is already reality is that machine learning is helping with uh, <clears throat> label data um, in order to, yeah, in, in our case, we have an experiment with, with uh, lung, uh, so computer tomography in lung cancer to help uh, how we can identify it, um, better and faster tumors. But if you think about the potential also in the diagnostic area, uh, and all of us have been uh, waived by generative AI, more the democratized part, most probably ChatGPT, which is uh, pressing the button. It's not as easy as it is, uh, but we use the label data. We will be able to use unstructured data, unlabeled data, and not only to have a faster diagnostic, but also eventually, still with a doctor at the center, a treatment path for the specific patients uh, in the future. So if you take discovery, uh, and which is a big part of what we do as, uh, in healthcare company, I mean, to already today, large language models are striving protein design and molecule design. Um, we have seen also approval already at the FDA of fully digitized uh, discovery. What does it mean? It means faster uh, approval uh, and faster discovery for patients. Um, we have we seen an, in clinical trials on identify the right patients um, for the for the, uh, for the clinical trials, especially as we are trying to battling more uh, rare disease and difficult disease to uh, to to intercept. Um, and even if we are at the end in delivery, access um, 
So if you think about market access, a lot of things we, we, we a lot of the access is based on static clinical trials, uh, so static in the past, but if you can think about with re including real world evidence uh, to bring also outcome based payments model uh, in the healthcare system, which is benefit from both sides, who will bring in the innovation on one side or who's, uh, and the healthcare funds on the other side. So it's a lot of opportunities, I think. Um, and for patients, what is important, we go towards the time which is called really personalized mm -hmm. therapies and precision medicine. And, and uh, what is important is, I think, is paramount that policy support that part um, as we remove some of the barriers which are existing on data. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, well, we will have time to discuss with, uh, with the people on, uh, here on this panel about the European health data space yes. and possibilities. Um, which is, I mean, and the other part, I think a lot of fear which is coming for artificial intelligence is about not knowing uh, what are, so, and what we don't know is scare us. Yeah. And but I think it's important, important to have the right inclusive education with healthcare practitioners, nurses, and whatever is uh, actors of the healthcare system getting familiar with digital tools. Perfect, great, thank you. Let's, let's go now to Uwe. Uwe, you're at Philips as well, uh, uh, a European company. What are you seeing in regards to opportunities or some of the challenges? Yeah, maybe let me, let me start with what we are actually doing. So we are exclusively in the area of healthcare. So we are in the medtech area, CTs, MRs, uh, monitors. But we are also in the health informatics uh, space. And what does it mean? We basically help our customers, our hospitals, our patient centers to generate data, to analyze the data, to do something meaningful, meaningful with the data, generate actionable insights for two reasons. One is uh, improve the patient outcome. And the other thing is improve the workflow efficiency for the hospitals and for the outpatient centers because we are lacking stuff very quickly and we are really lacking stuff. So that is actually very important. And it's actually very personal uh, to everybody. And just imagine you, a family member, a friend, is landing on an, in an emergency room. Wouldn't it be great, you know, if, if the doctor has access to the, mm. to the image you, you just took a, a week ago because we, you didn't feel well. Wouldn't it be great you know, to have the information about the medicine you cannot take because you are allergic to it? So these are the things we are doing and we are connecting. And it actually concerns everybody, everybody of us, because sooner or later, you know, somebody of us uh, is in this situation. Now, what are the, what are the barriers that we see today? Uh, one thing uh, is clearly uh, interoperability. Uh, so we are really struggling with that. If you look at the hospital, you know, it has 400 applications in, on average. Uh, they are not really talking to each other, let alone that the hospitals are talking with each other, let alone that the hospitals are talking with the outpatient centers, with the pharmacy, with the doctor uh, uh, abroad, with, the, with basically the, uh, the insurance company. So there is lots of interoperability questions coming up. Uh, the other thing is what we are seeing is a very not state-of-the-art infrastructure. Yeah? Uh, it's really a challenge. I mean, Wi-Fi, bandwidth. If you want to use AI, you better have good bandwidth. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, it's not working. So this is the thing. Then the third thing we are observing is quite challenging, also from a global company perspective, quite challenging regulations. So GDPR is implemented in I don't know how many ways. So we as a company really struggle with that. And it's being pointed out for many years already in our future health index. So these are the things we struggle. On top of this, we tend, in Europe, we tend to look at, to, at, at problems. We think always in risk and problems. That is giving us really struggle. Now, the solution could be European health data space. That could really help. It provides access to data. It provides a common platform. It basically also ensures data privacy, data security. It gives researchers access to, uh, to the data, so that is all going in the right direction, but we need to implement it in the right way. Funding is important. Uh, what is also important is a consistent regulation, yeah, really deployment, uh, which is making it, from a company perspective, rather easy to scale. And in informatics, in digital, it's all about scaling. Uh, so these are the things that are important. And then we should also enter more into <coughs> partnerships, into strategic partnerships, and we should really 
the opportunity is also very much in the space of collaboration, yeah, working on it together. Uwe, thank you very much uh, for your comments. And I'd like to move now to you, uh, uh, just to really, you know, you're, you're doing things in medical research. And what are the challenges that you're seeing? Yes, thank you, Ray. Good afternoon. So I'm here on behalf of the Biomed Alliance, which is uh, an umbrella organization. We represent 34 European research and medical societies. Our member societies are involved in basic research to clinical practice and to clinical practice, uh, from clinical practice to, to bench. And before starting or before covering the challenges, I would like to mention that uh, European health research is a joint venture. Mm. It's a partnership between private and public actors. And my members are researchers and healthcare professionals working in public hospitals, in medical universities, uh, in, in public and private research infrastructures across member states. Uh, they are involved in basic research, making medical discoveries, but also in the translational um, innovation cycle, conducting uh, clinical trials, pragmatic clinical trials. They are involved in population studies to address uh, health challenges and in also in education and speaking with them, um, moving or letting aside the regulations and aspects of provisions of European health data space, what they, what they are asking is to stay and work in EU, but also to, uh, to see European Union becoming a global leader when it comes to innovation in health research, when it comes to clinical trials and when it comes to, uh, to uh, technological and uh, med medical discoveries. Um, and I really, we really think from the Biomed Alliance perspective that European health data space, along with other policy and uh, um, regulations uh, uh, in, in digital healthcare, can, can move towards this idea to have European as a global leader in innovation research. But uh, I think uh, if I have to address some calls for the next European Commission mandate, I will just ask three main things. One thing is please implement in a consistent and harmonized way European health data space. It is very important and let's learn lessons from, Europe, from GDPR. Um, and a second call would be we need you to provide clarity on different legal aspects and on different harmon and provide harmonized uh, um, uh, interpretation and connections of European health, da health data space with other uh, policies. We, you, we, we, are, we have discussing about AI. There are others like medical devices regulations, IVDR regulations, clinical trials regulations. So we really need to understand the interlinkage between this. Uh, uh, regulations in order to help our researchers to do their job. And last but not least, please avoid to add uh, unnecessary bureaucracy when it comes to health data sharing. This is very important for our researchers to be able to Excellent. do their job. Lordana, thank you very much. And whoever is doing <coughs> this cartoon, please talk about consistent implementation of the EHDS <coughs> and these rules, because everyone here has said the exact same thing. And if I now turn to our uh, uh, representative from <coughs> Austria, and I'm so happy that you're here because it's important to hear about the member states. What is your experience in regards to technology and the implementation of technology in the healthcare systems? Um, what are you seeing are the you know, benefits or challenges? I would like to step in uh, where Francesco started. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have to think that the, the angel, if there's the angel in AI or in digitalization, also is nice to the public and that's the most challenging pro uh, problem all over my work that I have to explain the public why they would like to have digitalization mm -hmm. and where is it useful and uh, let's start with a, with a short story my grandfather was orthopedist 
uh, in the Tyrol. The Tyrol is very famous for skiing. I hope you will all go there and ski there. Um, but for sure, there are a lot of injuries, especially knee injuries if you go skiing. And so he was quite famous for, um, for, for therapeutic uh, such uh, knee injuries. A few years ago, I think two years ago, a big hyperscaler, American hyperscaler, developed an AI where you put millions of pictures of knee injuries inside and then you focus, okay, what happened afterwards? How was the therapy and what came out? And so we made a real benefit and we have to talk about these benefits of digitalization and artificial intelligence where it helps the people. It really helps the people in their daily life and that digitalization and AI will make the people more healthy in the future. What, what is government able to provide? I think the most important thing is the database, the data infrastructure. And that's why I'm for sure that the European health data space is the most important project when it comes to um, health data. The government, especially also the Austrian government, has to provide all the health data of their people, also the pictures, every health data they have in the same way with the same interfaces to the European health data space. And I know that that sounds not pretty realistic, but if we are looking in the north, if we look to Finland, for example, in the Nordic um, countries, we see that that is possible. And so 10 years ago, we opened our digital health record, but we only did it as a B2B solution for communication between different hospitals, for example. And we totally missed to make a B2C solution. Okay. There has to be a benefit for the individual with the digital health record. We have to make it useful for the people. We are not decades away where, where the, the, the doctor is the holy grail and I believe in everything, we have Dr. Google. Mm. Everybody is looking everything up in the internet. And so we have to make a B2C solution out of our digital health record that the people are interested, that every data is inside, and then we can provide it to the public, to the researchers, well, This is where the foundational uh, AI can come in because if you train those algorithms just on very specific medical information, Dr. Google gets a lot smarter, doesn't it? Exactly, because if we, if we are able to provide a good European health data space, private companies and the researchers, the good researchers we have here in Europe are able to do the rest. Okay. They can build up systems. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're going to be coming back to you. It's very important we hear from the member states. But I want to go to uh, Marco from the European Commission. I've known Marco for a while. And in my opinion, Marco is someone that gets the job done, right? We got the COVID certificate. We got, you know, good funding. We got AI testing labs, right? Now you've taken this director position and you have this huge challenge in the years ahead. How can industry member states help you? in these coming years? Well, first of all, thank you very much for your nice words. Yes, you're right. We did start to collaborate when we developed the first European electronic exchange format uh, six years ago. That was the first uh, attempt to solve the problem of interoperability that we heard today is one of the challenges that remains there. Now, uh, well, you know that we are negotiating the European L data space and uh, this, this, this will unfold over the coming weeks. The real question is now, what comes when, when the moment of implementations arise? So let me say that, first of all, I very much reassured and I welcome the support that we are getting from the stakeholders in the relative importance of the implementation of the regulations for innovation in Europe for advancing the way in which we do research, in which we take products from ideas to the market, and also realize the importance of the member states in you know, giving the patients something that they can use for taking possess of their own health path. And uh, I would say that if we split between member states and industry, for member states, I mean, I just echo what we just heard. It's a matter of embracing the modernizations of 
health and systems with digital and data. And this does require an enormous effort uh, on, in terms of capacity building. Capacity building means also uh, not only you know, creating a, an environment that is conducive to improvements, but it also requires a lot of communication. So I do uh, uh, understand and appreciate and that is probably the, uh, one of the key elements that we will have to you know, work in the future when it comes. Because everything that we have in the European Air Data Space will serve the purpose of these diverse stakeholders if the trust is there. And trust, mainly, the main foundations will, will really be the, um, the, the, you know, the, way, the, the communications in addition to creating the right infrastructure. Now, when it comes to industry, you know, it is a change management process the thing that revolves around modernizing health and system, healthcare systems in general through digital. And being a change management process requires the engagements from industry in providing also the underlining infrastructure. But most of all, it is the importance of creating an environment that is conducive to innovation. And for that, we do really need these corporations in Europe, creating networks of excellences that shares that information. Now, let me close this. It's, sorry if I go back to the COVID uh, time and the COVID, uh, you mentioned the COVID, the, COVID, uh, the COVID systems. I mean, that was the first instance of an interoperable electronic health record in Europe. But it was done in six months. So if we want, we can do it. Now, why did it work? Well, in, you know, of, of course, you, you have to remove the, let's say, the pressure that we had because of the, of, of, of the, of the pandemic. But then when it comes to the realizations of the benefits of the infrastructure, plus the sharing of data, what worked is that we went all together in the same direction. The member states, they took it up and created the infrastructures in the member states and the industry, they then exploited that solutions for their own uh, uh, let's say, for, for the investments, for the benefits of the citizens. And you're right, one of the elements is that is patient and citizen-centered. Uh, Marco, thank you very much. And again, to our, our cartoonist, the best message you've said, and, and everyone felt it in this room, is that member states, parliament, commission, everyone came together, worked together because there was an emergency. That emergency has not gone away. And everyone has to remember that. In these final negotiations for the EHDS, remember that. The emergency hasn't gone away. Let me get back to you, Francisco. Uh, you know, I want to talk about the impact of all these different regulatory approaches. And, you know, will it have an impact on innovation? Will it have an impact on deployment? How are you seeing things in your company? I think Loredana already mentioned a bit. Um, if you think about AI Act, GDPR, MedTech regulations, etc. Et so the, 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 to get clarity, and, and we are a big company, and I think we, we navigate that. But if you think about mid-sized companies, it's very complex how they can do that. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I'm here long working with you, uh, and we were the ones bringing the first paper out on trust together with Digital Europe, which is, as I say, in the cartoon, trust is vital. Um, <laughs> And we work a lot on the European health data space. I mean, we are close to the finish line. I don't know if it will happen uh, before election or after election, but if it happened um, before election, um, I hope that the spirit in the implementation remain, which was the spirit uh, that we had, which was foster innovation with protection of data and, and, and privacy uh, and ethical usage uh, of the data. And let me, uh, you were, you, you, the banning platform is now gone. Uh, that's what you were saying. And let me underline that we maintain the spirit in the implementation that what we implement is fit for purpose, um, considering the heterogeneity of the data that we, we, are, we are touching. Um, it's fit for the future, because if we are too static, I mean, I see a piece of innovation in my job that I've never seen before. Um, and we have to pay attention that we, the, 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 the framework is also covering innovation which is coming and not only that innovation that we have seen till now. Uh, and and um, it's workable. And when we saw workable, I think Loredana mentioned bureaucracy. Um, I think there's also to make sure that uh, how do we look at the IP protection, um, how do we look at sensible clinical uh, data in order that we 
there's also attractive for investment. Europe remains a, a place which is attractive for investment. Um, and yeah, it's already said, but let me also repeat from, from Johnson & Johnson, consistent of implementation. Mm -hmm. Um, let's not have, uh, and uh, at lunch we were speaking with Uber about the implementation of, unfortunately, of GDPR and, and even that we see 27 and more than 27 because in some countries we have also regions which have uh, possible interpretation of it. Let's not do the same. It's not going to work. Okay. Uh, it's not going to help no one of academic world or industry uh, on, on this possibility we have of really speed up innovation for patients. Yeah. And I like, I like this message that you're implementing that, you know, it's university, it is medical research, it is private industry that's coming together. I'll, I'll come back to you in just a second. Uwe, I just want to go to, this is a tough question, right? Future-proofing the European health systems. So, uh, you know, that's going to mean collaboration, member states, industry. How do you see it? Uh, I mean, collaboration is really the keyword. Everybody can do a lot and should do already everything which is possible, but at the end of the day, uh, we, nobody will be able to do it alone, yeah? to basically make sure that we're going to achieve the progress uh, that we have to achieve. Collaboration for us, for Philips, happens on, on different levels. Uh, it happens on the level of industry internal, yeah? so we need to cooperate and collaborate to also partly at least solve the interoperability problem, yeah? because this is also to a degree, it's to a degree also historic. Yeah? Um, what we also do is we, we're going to collaborate a lot with uh, hospitals, outpatient centers. Yeah? We have many, many research agreements uh, with these hospitals and, and, uh, and outpatient centers, so we can really uh, do things, good things together, uh, come to actionable insights that we can then roll out. Another thing we do is we're gonna we're collaborating with, with startups. Yeah, the, we have as an example in Hamburg, you know, where I'm based, we have a, a startup campus. Uh, we're gonna provide them not necessarily with funding. We're gonna provide them with access to all the actors in this in this space, and this is actually a big trouble for them. On top of this, the the biggest claim they make, help us to go through the regulation jungle because we, we feel we are always with one leg in prison, you know, if we do these things. And they cannot afford all these lawyers, which big companies can afford. So this is actually happening on the collaboration side, and, but we also need collaboration, industry, hospitals, innovators, and the government and the legislation. Yeah? So a, a good example is actually the uh, Cancer Image Europe project that was launched a while ago, uh, which creates really uniform platform uh, for, to ex basically to store, to exchange data related to cancer. Uh, we're going to have, we're going to ensure access. It's consistent. It's proven. Uh, it's basically showing that data privacy, data security is ensured. And I think we actually need more of these examples uh, to, to make things happen. Yeah? And uh, it's partly regulation, it's partly also funding, but it's really about doing things together. And coming back to my other example, which I just had in the beginning, like, you know, why not having something like this for an ICU? Yeah? If you go even in another country, you know, where nobody knows anything about your personal and your health data, uh, you are basically there on the table and everybody tries to figure out what is actually your problem. Yeah? So this is really, it's actually really concerning all of us, and I, yeah, and, and that is why I'm so passionate also I, about making this happen. I think you got the, the, the next big tagline that I'm going to shout out to our mm -hmm. cartoonist. More examples where funding leads to innovation. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I know Marco is itching to answer, but just hold on a little bit longer. I'm going to want to go to, to you, Lordana. Just let us know as well what you can add to this discussion on these challenges we need to hit for the next five years. And we've got to keep it short because we're running out of time. Yeah, I see the, the, yeah. the, the red uh, clock there. Um, I think I will just build on what have uh, already uh, been said. Uh, European health data space is a complex dossier, is a complex uh, regulation. I think for the implementation phase, um, uh, stakeholders uh, must be included from industry, patients, academia, in order to be able to implement this. 
Um, I'm a bit naive. I know that the, 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 the regulation is now in, in, in the discussions, in the trial of negotiations, but I still think there is still time to, to uh, make right some provisions in the regulations. I will not go into detail, but I will just mention that to, uh, we should not forget that sometimes uh, this opt-in, opt-out uh, system uh, could affect the harmonization and the usefulness of health data sharing for both innovation and healthcare purposes, so we should be careful with how we implement these systems in the, in the regulation. And I think my last mes message is let's build also on the Horizon Europe uh, project uh, dealing with data. I think that we have wonderful or wonderful results from Horizon Europe projects. There are also a lot of best practices coming from public-private partnerships. So already we have a consistent amount of cases that can lead us to have a good implementation of European health data. Lordana, thank you very much because I know that you have have been uh, a part of these letters uh, with other NGOs, patient groups, medical institutes, 35 of them coming together, trying to tell the member states we need data because then that removes the bias in the AI. It drives the digitalization. Uh, but, you know, these things are, are obviously very difficult. And But listen, please, to her if you're in the negotiations. <laughs> Gentleman next to me, I know there's some people in the audience as well. Yeah. But Just Mr. we have a recent statement on our uh, page, website page, so with Great. concrete recommendations, so just please go there. As it please is. go there. <laughs> please go there. And Mr. Tursky, let me, let me ask you, or Florian, if I may, you have the best question coming up here. So you have a magic wand to the EU institutions, to the Commission. What do you want from them to support you in your job for the next five years in this digitalization of healthcare? But you have to keep it short, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the, the most important one for government as well as for, for companies will be legal certainty. Mm. We, we talk a lot about the AI Act. We, we talked about the GDPR. And that's, for me, the major problem is legal certainty for small and medium enterprises. The big hyperscaler will can afford that, will manage that with a lot of lawyers. But that will really affect also our ability to make innovation in Europe. If there is a regulation which does not give this legal certainty, especially in the health sector, which is so also in the heads of the people, health data is quite sensitive. For sure, it's the most sensitive data you can, you can use, even more sensitive than financial data. And so there has to be trust and there has to be legal certainty. And so that's also uh, when we talk about an opt-in, opt-out um, solution. We have to be total transparent. We have to, be, we have to focus on usability. In all, all our, our gadget, we, decades ago, we were dealing between different systems and different governments, who is more innovative, who is cooler, who has the better app. Today, we are, we are dealing with Tinder, for example. So our digital health record and our app solutions has to be as easy and as usable as the newest dating app. Mm. And I think that's... But that's the thing of the private sector. We have to provide the data and we have to provide legal certainty. And then the private sector is able to build solutions on that infrastructure. Okay, that, that's great. And I fully agree with this. But there's another thing we also need to add, add besides legal certainty, and I definitely agree with that because that came in very strong in the poll. We need health certainty. We need to know when we're sick or a loved one is sick, we can get that care. And we have the technology and innovations that can solve a lot of these things. So how do we get that health certainty? Marco, let me come to you. Uh, you've heard a lot here. I heard your eyes light up, you know, on how the commission can weigh in. I heard, especially when we're talking about, you know, show us the money. <laughs> there is instruments at the commission. It's really for you to, to take the next three minutes and, and just let us know which parts here you want to so, okay. highlight. The, 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 first, the first thing is, is, is for, for Uwe. I, I hope that 
the, the data space on ICU will come forward as a next uh, thing. It's already planned, so we, I guess that it will come at some stage under the Digital Euro program. Um, the, uh, the, the, say, the first point certainly is the fact that we need, if I hear uh, you and the other stakeholders, we need to go into the implementations mode for, uh, you know, once the, the EL data space is adopted, we need to make sure that it is implemented, it is implemented in, uh, in a coherent way to facilitate exactly that process of innovation that you are actually calling for. Uh, by the way, even the reference to the Cancer Imaging Initiative is very well anchored under the European Health Data Space because that's the purpose. The purpose is that you give availability and access to a significant amount of data so that, that somebody else can actually generate benefits for the citizens. Now, so if we take the first layer, say implement, then the second layer, well, let's go into AI, uh, certainly, you know, we will not be short of new ideas on how to apply AI in healthcare. That will not, uh, that's not a problem, you know. The problem is that AI, per se, will also need a process for adoption, which is, uh, uh, it, again, it's nested in the concept of change management, because, you know, it's AI taken into real-world settings where there is a relationship already founded between the patients and the doctor. Now, you talked about generative AI. The moment generative AI will get into that setting, it will change and reshape the relation between the patients and the doctors and the healthcare workforces in general. And it will shape it in a way that we need to not only anticipate, we need to understand, we need to master and work for it. Because imagine, you know, as, a, as an agent, AI, you know, will filter the way in which information is passed from the doctors to the city. So in which way this new artifact changes that relationship, we need to master that. And it, 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 will, it means, first of all, that we produce innovation with the benefits of the citizens in our minds. So meaning that this needs to be integrated in a workflow and say the member states will need to take this. But you know, it, it is not going into a vacuum. You know, it's not just posting it on Apple uh, uh, or, or Google uh, store. We need to put it into the sector where there are people and a workforce that is already delivering a service which needs to adapt to that technology. And per se, this is a process that we need to facilitate and support. So uh, these are the challenges that I see emerging from the discussions today, and we will not fail to provide the support. And I think the great thing is a lot of alignment between both of you, right? We have uh, Austria here that wants to create that consumer tech and make an industry able to do that using data, and then you yourself on that change manager to facilitate that. Um, uh, we have just three minutes, so I think we have to keep very, very short statements. Uh, so I think I'm just going to now go to you and give you an opportunity to take maybe 30, 40 seconds to kind of say, what do you want to see in, in the next you know, uh, uh, five years? We have the paper, so you can read it there. But maybe I could start with, with you, Francesco. Just a Florian, I think big companies have the opportunity to manage the navigation, but they might also do R&D somewhere else. Mm. And, and that's the risk for Europe. But for, for me, is let's enable the possibility for patients that we have in the next years. If they are great opportunity, let's not kill them with bureaucracy. So that's, I think, my statement at the end. Great, fully agree. Uh, maybe I can just go down the, uh, down the line here, Lordana. Well, I, I think I will repeat what I said in the, in the beginning of this panel. Uh, if we want to see European as a global leader in clinical trials, in innovation, in health research, let's make all these legislative proposals uh, as tools to support this and not to, uh, to hamper uh, this goal. Great, great. Uwe? Actually, I want to see, would want to see consistency in what we are doing. Uh, still having innovation in place. I want to see actually speed. We really, as Europe, in general, everywhere, we need to speed up significantly to really not lose traction. 
Uh, and the third thing is actually, let's see the opportunity. We tend to do much more, think, uh, we think more about the risk and the danger and how could it harm full to anybody, which is important, but let's see the opportunity. Be positive about what we can have. Okay, yeah, I think that's very important. Uh, be positive, please, to the cartoon. <laughs> We spent a lot of time over the last years to build a legal framework also to make innova innovation happening in Europe. Uh, let's talk about the, di the Digital Service Act, but also the Data Act or the Data Governance Act. And now it's time to bring that to life over the next years. We have to implement it and also take it as an opportunity to make innovation happen. And do you feel Data Act, Data Governance Act is going to create a lot of great the Data Governance Austrian... Act for sure. Yeah, okay. Data Governance Act. Fantastic, sure. fantastic. The last word goes to you, Marco. I second what I heard. And I think that we have the ingredients and let's deliver it now. So that's it. Wow, okay, very simple. We're actually going to give back a couple of seconds to you in the audience. So thank you very much to my panelists. And uh, please stay for the rest of the conference. There's a lot more exciting panels to discuss. And I thank you very much to my panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.